Thank you, Gail. It's a, it's certainly an honor. If I can, we suggest that. Is that okay? It's certainly an honor to be here and uh, to join you in this presentation tonight. This is a remarkable opportunity for us to consider key and foundational principles for us in our history and the the, the great shoulders that we stand on. I would like to share maybe the genesis of this. Uh, month that we're in the midst of celebrating and this is really uh, kind of a capstone bookend to the month of September. In 2023 I received a, a call from a wonderful citizen of the state talking about Jen Brown who's involved, uh, she actually is in the Republican Party chairs the federalism uh, committee for the U Utah Republican Party. And she talked, she'd been on the phone with uh, some folks in Florida, and they had just passed what was called the Constitutional Month. And they had a very simple language setting aside the month of September to celebrate and remember and learn about the Constitution. And uh, we talked about that and recognized that there might be a wonderful opportunity here in the state of Utah to do that. It's really interesting as we look at uh, our landscape and based on the great heritage, the shoulders that we stand on here in this state, what type of opportunities we have, and yet also the, the trade winds that are, are, are blowing amongst us today. One of the challenges, I had the opportunity to serve in the House of Representatives. I was actually uh, uh, midterm uh, 12 years ago, uh, appointed by Governor Herbert. Uh, as a result of a nomination by the Re Utah County Republican Party. But I've, as I've observed, one of the things that has brought great concern to me is the lack of understanding oftentimes to constitutional principle and an understanding of being aligned with the Constitution. It's almost in many cases that we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten the great gifts and heritage that we've been given. And with that in mind, we put together a draft bill to present uh, on the House, uh, present to the House to, to consider. As you know, bills generally they they're presented and they're assigned to a committee. And so here we are in this committee, and we have twelve members of the committee there. And in context, this was in 2023. So put ourselves in that context. We were we were just in the midst of the challenges with COVID was just upon the doorstep. Remember, it hit as, just as the legislative session ended and we had an earthquake and a snowstorm. <laughs> that was, sorry, two years earlier. We did, we'd gone through the, the COVID experience, but also we had had the challenges with the rioting that had taken place and a lot of, lot of uh, desire, perhaps, to rewrite history. Uh, and, and so a lot of challenges, a lot of attacking of our founding fathers, because if we can discredit them, we can discredit the work that they've done. A lot of challenges, but we presented the piece of legislation in committee, and it just barely passed out of committee. There was actually 12 members of committee, six voted for it, three against. It was directly party lines. There were six, and so it was really, a, at the time, very divisive in its, its formation. I picked up the phone and reached out to uh, Elder Callis. Callister and he and I and the, the good citizen Jen Brown spent some time talking about what we needed to do. And I wanted to share with you the language of this piece of legislation. Really, as we were able to present this language as an amendment on the House floor, we only had two votes against it. So both sides of the aisle were in favor and as it went to the Senate, it was unanimous. And it's really interesting to see how as we work together and we work on getting it right, what can take place. But we're very concerned about making sure that if we're going to have this Founders and Constitutional Month, that we go right to the headwaters and we go to original sources. And so we, we memorialize that language in legislation. And I'll just share that, that with you. And then... Uh, I know we're here to hear the counselors, and I'll sit down and I'll, I'll give it to the introduction, but this is what it is. The month of September shall be commemorated annually as American Founders and Constitutional Month. Two, 
encourage all civic, fraternal, and religious organizations in public and private educational institutions to recognize, observe this, this occasion through appropriate programs, teaching, meetings, services, or celebrations in which state, county, and local government officials are invited to participate and invite all Utah school children to read directly from the United States Constitution and other primary sources. That's very critical, to read directly from the Constitution and other primary sources and to be taught principles from the United States Constitution that include federalism, checks and balances, separation of powers, popular sovereignty, limited government, and the necessary and proper commerce and supremacy clauses. Well, that was the language. And I would just like to share that uh, as we worked and we, we talked about that in, in that, that visit, and then uh, Elder Callister, I invited him to be the great author and, and, and wordsmith that he is, take a whack at it. His DNA is all over that. So let's thank him for that and for being involved there. And that often, and I would just say, that is often how we come up with the best legislation. It's working with all perspectives and, and looking at language and the intent of the language that oftentimes comes not outside the legislative rooms, but uh, in, involving discussions and, and those that each of us. That's the beauty of our, I think, our, our form of government here in the state of Utah. We have a part-time legislature. We wear hats, many hats. One of them is that of being a citizen legislator. And that's a, a, a great blessing. Well, so great for the Callisters. Their presence here and who they represent. It's, I asked the granddaughter, uh, how would you introduce your grandparents? She said, well, grandma is the backbone of the family. She is the, the one, and that not that true? You look at all the wonderful things Brother Callister has done throughout his life, an author, a member of the 70, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, presidency for many years, an author, presidency of the Sunday school, president of the Sunday school. You find someone that's really good and then ask their spouse to do the job. And so I, I would say Sister Callister has really been a blessing. You're going to see these two interact here as they present. It's a, good, a real treat to just observe that. There's great lessons in just the way they interact. But So grandma is the backbone of the family. Grandpa, he's pretty competitive, she said. And uh, I could never beat him in, in racquetball. We've, I've been able to do okay once in a while in pickleball, but he's really competitive, a lot of fun. Not a wonderful way for a granddaughter to describe grandpa and grandma. Parents of six children, grandparents of 29, four great-grandchildren. Certainly the most important aspects of their life, as you see, would be that, their family. And then, of course, their devotion to God and country. So grateful to have them here today. The opportunity will speak for itself, what they present will speak for itself as we have a chance to bask in, in this truth and principled presentation. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Representative Stratton, and uh, he really was the catalyst in getting this legislation passed. I may have added a semicolon or something, but he was the genius. And we're glad to have my granddaughter here, Naomi. Uh, she asked me to announce that she's single and would be happy to meet your handsome sons and grandsons. I think that's what you said, Naomi, wasn't that? <laughs> And we're so glad to have Elder, or Elder Governor, former Governor Herbert here, but we also want to pay tribute to his sweet wife, Jeanette. Would you stand, Jeanette? We understand the wife. What a wonderful team they are. And uh, I have a medical condition that affects my speech. So I hope uh, I can be clear and you can understand me and the Holy Ghost will be with us. And so my wife will help with some of the quotes and much of the text as we talk together about God's hand 
in the origin and destiny of America. Well, despite America's remarkable freedoms and achievements, some, as you know, have sought to focus on the faults of our founding fathers. As a result, patriotism is on a substantial decline. Some of you may have seen the survey on the screen published about a year ago in the Wall Street Journal. As you will know, patriotism was considered very important by 70% of the population in 1998. Just 25 years later, in 2023, that figure dropped to 38%. The decline in religion followed a similar trend. Perhaps we could ask ourselves, what caused this decline and what can we do to reverse it? In restoring patriotism, a key question to be answered by all Americans is the following. Was God's hand in the origin and establishment of America, or was it a secular founding? For example, were the pilgrims inspired to come to America, or did they come for some other reason? In 1930, the first presidency of the church taught this truth about the pilgrims. It was not by chance that the Puritans left their native land and sailed away to the shores of New England, and the others followed later. They were the advanced guard of the army of the Lord, foreordained to establish the God-given system of government under which we live, and prepare the way for the restoration of the gospel. Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French political scientist and historian, gave a similar answer. He said that the pilgrims were the scattering of a seed of a great people, which God with his own hands is planting on a predestined shore. But was God's hand also involved in the Revolutionary War? David McCullough, the famous historian, writes of the dire circumstances of Valley Forge. He said that the soldiers were in rags, without sufficient food, and lacking the pay they had earned. The enlistments for Washington's army were expiring at year's end, December 31st, 1776. This meant that the soldiers could leave the next day and return to their families. Washington called a large portion of the troops before him and offered them an extra month's salary if they would re-enlist for six months. This was a substantial bonus, particularly considering that most of the families were in dire financial straits. McCullough describes what happens next. He said the drums rolled, and Washington lost all those who would stay on to step forward. The drums kept rolling, and nobody stepped forward. One can imagine the heartbreak, the overwhelming sense of despondency that must have weighed upon Washington. And one day he would be a commander without an army. The vision of independence must have seemed like a free fleeting dream. Washington then started to ride away. But in that moment, it must have dawned upon him that there was a power, a motivational power far greater than that of money. He returned to the troops and said the following. My brave fellows, you have done all I asked you to do and more than could be reasonably expected, but your country is at stake, your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will consent to stay one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country, which you can probably never do under any other circumstance. McCullough then writes, Again the drum rolled. This time the men began stepping forward. Now that is an amazing scene, said McCullough, to the, say the least, and it's real. He said this wasn't some contrivance of a screenwriter. No wonder Nathaniel Green, one of Washington's generals, noted of the occasion. 
God Almighty inclined their hearts to listen to the proposal, and they engaged anew. When money was insufficient, it was a higher power, God, family, and patriotism, that caused them to put their lives and fortunes on the line for an extended period. In recalling those hallowed days, George Washington spoke these farewell words to his army on November 2nd, 1783. The disadvantageous circumstances on our part under which the war was under undertaken can never be forgotten. The singular interpositions of providence in our feeble condition were such as could scarcely escape the attention of the most unobserving, while the unparalleled perseverance of the armies was little short of a standing miracle. And on another occasion, Washington said, the man must be bad indeed who can look upon the events of the American Revolution without feeling the warmest gratitude towards the great author of the universe, whose divine interposition was so frequently manifested in our behalf. Again and again and again, the Founding Fathers attested to God's hand in America. But were the Founding Fathers deists? Many claim that a significant number of the Founding Fathers were deists. The term deists, however, is widely misunderstood and misused. The most accepted definition of a deist is someone who believes God created the world, but believes he does not intervene in its affairs thereafter. God created the world, they believe, and then left man to men to their own powers of reason to conduct all worldly affairs. I am not aware of any of the Founding Fathers who was a deist in that sense of the term, except perhaps Ethan Allen and Thomas Paine. Today's presentation will be evidence of that conclusion. One simple example is that 56 Founding Fathers signed their name to the Declaration of Independence, which concludes with these words, with a firm reliance on what? The protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. If a deist believes that God does not intervene in the affairs of men, why would these founding fathers unanimously acknowledge the firm reliance on the future protection of divine providence. Such a statement would be in direct opposition to a deist foundational belief. We will discuss many more examples of the Founding Fathers' belief that God's hand was indeed in the establishment of America. This thus discrediting the claim that they were pre as previously defined. Lest there be any question, I'm not aware of any of the Founding Fathers who did not have a belief in God. Some cite Thomas Paine as an example of a non-believer, but I quote his own words in contradiction to this sentiment. He said, I believe in one God and no more, and I hope for happiness beyond this life. The God in whom we believe is a God of moral truth. And now let's see how God's hand was repeatedly acknowledged by the Founding Fathers in the formation of our nation's charter document. The Declaration of Independence. Divinely inspired? A key question to be answered by all Americans is the following. With the Declaration of Independence and, and Constitution secular or inspired documents, the sole work of man's genius or divinely directed by God. <clears throat> A revolt by the Founding Fathers against the British Crown <clears throat> was considered treason of the highest order. You will recall that Benjamin Franklin, sensing the seriousness of the time and the need for unity among all the signers of the Declaration of Independence, we must all hang together, or most surely 
we will all hang separately. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence were not just signing a nicely written proclamation with wonderful philosophical and moral ideas. They knew they could be signing their own death sentences. Benjamin Roth, Ross, one of the signers, wrote to John Adams the following. Do you recollect the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the House when we were called up one after another to the table of the President of the Congress to su subscribe what was believed by many at that time to be our own death warrants? They knew that if the little colonies of America did not prevail, they would be hanged as traitors to the crown. Yet they sent a divine destiny in this country that compelled them to put their pen to perhaps the greatest document of freedom the world has ever known. Before signing this inspired document, John Adams declared, there is a divinity which shapes our ends. Thomas Jefferson, who drafted the Declaration of Independence, gave us these words etched in marble on his memorial. God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? It was these deeply held beliefs that inspired and guided Jefferson in drafting the Declaration of Independence. Lest there be any question about the divine origin of this country and the Declaration of Independence, modern prophets have addressed that issue with certainty. President Brigham Young wrote, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were inspired from on high to do that work. And President Grillard B. Hinckley stated, both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States were brought forth under the inspiration of God to establish and maintain the freedom of the people of this nation. This, there, he said, is a miracle in its establishment that cannot be explained in any other way. Both the Founding Fathers and Prophets of God have attested to the divine nature of the Declaration of Independence, a glorious and sacred document revered and respected by all God's fearing Americans. Was the Constitution a secular or an inspired document? And if the latter, what evidence do we have of its inspired nature? My husband, Tad, recently started reading a book entitled The Godless Constitution, written by two college professors, not in Utah. They made generalization after generalization in an attempt to support their position. He kept asking himself, where are the footnotes to the primary sources supporting such points? But page after page, there were none, absolutely none. He was totally shocked. And then he read this statement at the end of their book. Because we have intended the book to reach a general audience, and also because the material we have cited is for the most part familiar to historians and political scientists, we have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. <laughs> if you were their teacher, what grade would you have given them? He would have given them an F. Reference to primary sources is essential to discovering the truth. Unlike these professed scholars, we will make reference to primary sources to prove the opposite of what they asserted, namely to prove that God's hand was indeed in the origin and establishment of America. Did the founding fathers believe the Constitution was divinely inspired? To demonstrate how prevalent the Bible was in the thinking of the founding fathers, Donald S. Lutz, a professor of political science at the University of Houston, took a survey of the founding fathers' writings between 1760 and 1805, and he categorized their quotes as follows. References to the Bible, 34%. Montesquieu, 
8.3%. References to Blackstone, 7.9%. To Locke, 2.9%. Hume, 2.7%. Suffice it to say, the Bible had a profound influence on the political thinking of the Founding Fathers. James Madison, often referred to as the father of the Constitution, reflected upon the hand of God and the miraculous achievement of such a document. He said, It is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand which has been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of the Revolution. George Washington con concurred in this assessment. The adoption of the Constitution will demonstrate as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. No wonder that historian Catherine Drinker Bowen, who wrote the best-selling book setting forth the details of the Constitutional Convention, titled it Miracle at Philadelphia. The actual word miracle, however, was not her invention, but was first used by Washington and Madison to describe the, the convention's historic outcome. Divine witnesses of the Constitution's inspired nature. In addition to the testimony of the Founding Fathers and reputable historians, we have multiple heavenly and prophetic witnesses of the divine nature of the Constitution. In fact, the Lord, through the prophet Joseph Smith, spoke to this issue on at least three occasions as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. I refer to two of them as follows. And for this purpose have I established the constitution of this land by the hands of wise men whom I raised up unto this very purpose. Some may initially question the inspired calling of the Founding Fathers or use their own reasoning to come to a different conclusion, but once the Lord has spoken on a given subject, the debate is over. And on yet another occasion, Joseph Smith, in offering the dedicatory prayer for the Kirtland Temple, bled, Have mercy, O Lord, upon all the nations of the earth. Have mercy upon the rulers of our land. May those principles which were so honorably and nobly defended, namely the constitution of our land by our fathers, be established forever. Note the wording, not to be dismantled and redone, but to be established forever. Again and again, divine witnesses have borne their testimony of the Constitution's inspired origin. Following is a further sampling of prophetic statements concerning our inspired Constitution. Joseph Smith taught, the Constitution of the United States is a glorious standard. It is founded on the wisdom of God. It is a heavenly banner. President David O. McKay instructed members of the church, next to being one in worshiping God, there is nothing in this world upon which the church should be more united than in upholding and defending the Constitution of the United States. President F. Sir Tack Benson added his witness, I reverence the Constitution of the United States as a sacred document. To me, the words are akin to the revelations of God for God has placed his stamp of approval on the constitution of this land. President J. Reuben Clark Jr. pointed out that the constitution was not just to provide freedom for freedom's sake, but to provide the, an environment in which Christ's church could be restored to the earth. To me, the constitution is part of my religion because under no other government in the world could the church have been established as it has been established under this government. Do we have any evidence of the Constitution's divinity in addition to the testimony of the Founding Fathers, historians, modern prophets, and the Lord himself? We do. There is something intrinsic about the nature of that document that oozes with divinity. Inspired principles of the Constitution. President Dallin H. Oaks, as you know, a former law professor at the University of Chicago and justice of the Utah Supreme Court, and it tells of a professor who, over time, spoke to a number of Latter day Saint students. The professor then made this surprising observation Quote, They all seem to believe that the Constitution was divinely inspired 
but none of them could ever tell me what this meant or how it affected their interpretation of the Constitution. <clears throat> President Oak took that as a challenge and then wrote a brilliant article setting forth five ways in which the Constitution is inspired. I will try to briefly summarize three of those for the sake of time. First, separation of powers as evidenced by the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government that exert checks and balances on each other and thus put a restraint on human nature's quest for power. Second, a written bill of rights that includes the protection of individual liberties, such as freedom of religion, assembly, and speech, all of which are necessary to protect our God-given liberties and maximize our pursuit of happiness. And third, division of powers between the federal government and the states, which President Oaks noted was unprecedented in theory or practice. He further observed the particular powers that are reserved to the states are part of the inspiration. For example, the power to make laws on personal relationships is reserved to the states. The laws of marriage and family rights and duties are state laws. The Constitution is a unique document in history. And the uniqueness of the Constitution is another witness of its inspired origin. The Constitution was not just a patchwork of ideas from other nations' constitutions. Benjamin Franklin wrote, We have gone back to ancient history for models of government and examined the different forms of those republics. That we have viewed modern states all around Europe but find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. James Madison spoke of the uniqueness of the document in the entirety of all history. He said, happily for America, happily we trust for the whole human race, the founders of this nation accomplished a revolution which has no parallel in the annals of human society. They reared the fabrics of government which have no model on the face of the globe. I know some might argue otherwise, but those are the words of the founding fathers, those who created this marvelous document. They are the primary sources. And David McCullough, the famous historical author, likewise knew this distinctive and remarkable accomplishment. He said, never, Never anywhere has there been a government instituted on the consent of the governed. Sadly, too many today take for granted public schools, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, equality before the law, forgetting that these were ever noble and daring ideas. Fortunately, God raised up the Founding Fathers to produce this divinely inspired constitution. It is no wonder that William Pitt, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, should say, the American Constitution will be the wonder and admiration of all future generations and the model of all future constitutions. William Gladstone, another British Prime Minister, made a similar observation. He said, the American Constitution is, so far as I can see, the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. The drafting and ratification of the Constitution was indeed a unique and providential moment in history. Some, however, might argue that even without our founding fathers, our democracy would have eventually evolved, and therefore they did nothing special that history would not be come to such a proposition. At the time of our Father's noble experiment, there was nothing like it in the world. For centuries, even millennia of prior recorded history, there was no comparable democracy on earth 
They had the breadth of liberty and lasting power of what they created. Greece and Rome and Great Britain certainly had elements of democracy and to a limited extent the Iroquois Confederacy, but not nearly the extent of liberties and genius of administrative structure proposed by the Constitution. The world was and had been filled with kings and queens and tyrants and dictators and Caesars and aristocracy, but what nation was truly governed by we the people? The Founding Fathers' proposal was a bold and genius initiative, after which many other countries would subsequently pattern their governments. If nothing else, the burden of proof has shifted to the critics that the Founding Fathers established our democracy or constitutional republic is a certainty that there would have been a similar constitutional republic without them is no more than a speculative possibility without any historical precedent. Next, if the Constitution is inspired, why doesn't it explicitly prohibit slavery? Some argue that the Constitution could not have been inspired because it did not prohibit slavery. In fact, I received a letter from a law professor stating that the Constitution codified slavery and therefore it should be so stated in a booklet that a nonprofit had written about America. I wrote back to the law professor that such a proposed statement was not included because it was both doctrinally and historically incorrect. Now the evidence of this. First, has the Lord spoken on this subject? He has. He states in the Doctrine and Covenants this eternal truth, quote, it is not right that any man should be in bondage to one to another, meaning that slavery is not acceptable to the Lord. You know what the very next sentence says? <clears throat> and for this purpose, what purpose? To eliminate slavery, I have established what? The constitution of this land by the hands of wise men, whom I raise up to this very purpose. In other words, how could the constitution codify slavery if the Lord said it was established to eliminate slavery. <clears throat> this document would set forth the eternal truth that all men and women are created equal and thus entitled to equal freedom. But the Lord knew the ideal alone would not accomplish the goal. It would take many interim steps, including the Civil War and constitutional amendments to enforce it, but they would come line upon line, precept upon precept, just as Revelation comes. Abraham Lincoln understood this. He reprimanded the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, who wrote an opinion on the Dred Scott case, perhaps the worst case in American history, which said that the Constitution did not intend to provide equal rights for blacks. Lincoln then made this very significant observation. They, the Founding Fathers, defined with tolerable distinctness in what respects they did consider all men created equal. Equal were certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This they said, and this they meant. They did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all were then actually enjoying that equality, nor yet that they were about to confer it immediately upon them. They meant simply to declare the right so that the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. This confirms that Lincoln's analysis was correct. There were compromises along the way to achieve equality for all. But that equality would evolve as circumstances permitted, just as Lincoln noted. Without such compromises, however, 
there would have been no Constitution and no United States of America. Furthermore, if the Constitution codified slavery, as some alleged, then that would mean that Congress could pass no law prohibiting slavery since the Constitution is the highest law of the land. But such was not the case. You may recall that at the same time the Constitution was adopted and ratified, the same Congress in 1789 ratified the Northwest Ordinance, in which the law stated, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in said territory. If the Constitution, the highest law of the land, codified slavery, how could the same Congress enact a law prohibiting slavery in the Northwest Territory? Furthermore, Section 9 of Article 1 of the Constitution, not known by many, provided that in 1808, 20 years after the Constitution was adopted, Congress could prohibit the importation of slaves into the U.S. Pursuant to that section, Congress adopted the Act prohibiting the importation of slaves effective January 1st, 1808, the earliest possible day at which it could do so. But if the Constitution codified slavery and was the highest law of the land, how could Congress thereafter prohibit the importation of slavery? Later in the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, and thereafter the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution would substantially enhance the freedom process. But the Constitution was a stepping stone that made those events possible. How could imperfect men produce an inspired Constitution? The Founding Fathers certainly had their weaknesses, but if God could use only perfect men to advance his work, he would be left empty-handed. To illustrate, suppose I were to tell you only these three historical facts about a New Testament character, and nothing more. First, in a fit of rage, this man cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. Second, this man denied knowing the Savior on three occasions, even though he walked with him daily. And third, on one occasion, the Savior said to this man, Get thee behind me, Satan. What would you think about this man if, if that were all you knew about him? You might think him a scoundrel or no good, but that would be a severe misjudgment. This man, of course, was Peter, Christ's chief apostle. Would these imperfections cause you to denigrate the man, or instead would you say his imperfections were only a small part of the total man? If we focus only on Peter's weaknesses and dismiss, dismiss his countermanding strengths, we will have dismissed, we have missed the real man and his inspired mission. The man who raised the dead, the lame, the man who had angelic visitations, the man who gave his life for Christ and his church. Where the critic sees only warts and blemishes, God sees the beauty and strengths, and then he uses them to further his cause. And so it was with the Founding Fathers. F.W. Borum, a Baptist minister and author, gave us some profound insights on how God directs and influences the destiny of nations. In 1809, men were following with bated breath the march of Napoleon and waiting with feverish impatience for the latest news of the wars. And all the while, in their own homes, Babies were being born. But who could think about babies? Everybody was thinking about battles. In one year, lying midway between Trafalgar and Waterloo, there stole into the world a host of heroes. During that one year, 1809, Mr. William Gladstone was born in Liverpool, Alfred Tennyson at the Summersby Rectory, and Oliver Wendell Holmes made his first appearance in Massachusetts. Abraham Lincoln drew his first breath at Old Kentucky. Music was enriched by the advent of Felix Mendelssohn in Hamburg. 
But nobody thought of babies. Everyone was thinking of battles. Yet which of the battles of 1809 mattered more than the babies of 1809? We fancy that God can only manage his world by big battalions abroad, while all the while he is doing it by beautiful babies at home. When a wrong wants writing, or a work wants doing, or a truth wants preaching, or a continent wants opening, God sends a baby into the world to do it. And thus God provided for the events leading to the establishment of this country with the births of the founding fathers and their wives, perhaps the most extraordinary group of men and women to be born at one time, in one place. Historian Barbara W. Tuckman noted, it would be invaluable if we could know what produced this burst of talent from a base of only two and a half million inhabitants. But we do know what produced this burst of talent. It was not a series of random births or a series of genetic aberrations. Rather, it was pursuant to God's master plan for America. The Bible tells us that God hath determined the times before appointed, meaning when we would come to the earth, and the bounds of our habitation, meaning where we would be born. And so it was with the founding fathers. God sent them at a specified time and to a specified place to fulfill their divinely appointed mission, which including the dra included the drafting of our inspired Constitution. Will the time come when the Constitution will hang by a thread? Despite the overwhelming evidence that the Constitution is an inspired document, Joseph Smith prophesied that the time would come when the Constitution and government would hang by a brittle thread. Some have questioned whether this prophecy was ever documented. I did. But thanks to Gerald Lund and others, we have multiple witnesses of its veracity. Brigham Young was one such witness. He said, Joseph Smith said the time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread. At that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from threatened destruction. It will be so. Jedediah and Grant added his confirmation. What did the Lord, what did the prophet Joseph say? When the Constitution shall be tottering, we shall be the people to save it from the hand of the foe. Eliza Arsenal was yet another witness. I heard Joseph Smith say that the time would come when this nation would so far depart from its original purity, its glory, and its love for freedom, and its protection of civil rights and religious rights, that the constitution of our country would hang, as it were, by a thread. He said also that the sons of Zion would rise up and save the constitution bear it off triumphantly. We see this happening before our very eyes. President Ezra Taft Benson spoke of this specific property, prophecy and how the Constitution would be saved in the last days. He said, it will be saved by the citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom. It will be saved by men and women who will subscribe to and abide by the principles of the Constitution. Hopefully, this includes you and me. The Founding Fathers, Heroes or Villains? Were the Founding Fathers heroes or, as some claim, villains? Ted Stewart, a federal judge and author, put this question in its proper light. Today, it is common to criticize the Founders of America. Judging them by today's standards of equality and justice, they do fail. Some owned slaves, none fought to give women equal rights. Most were wealthy white men, yes, Judging the founders by today's standards of equality and justice, they fail. But there is just one problem with judging them by today's standards, and it is this. But for those imperfect founders and the sacrifices they made and the instruments of government which they created, there would be no current enlightened standards of equality and justice by which to judge them. Judge Stewart is so right. Critics can freely criticize, protest, vote for change, run for office, and exercise freedom of religion or irreligion as they choose for one reason and one reason only, because the Founding Fathers made it so. If critics are unwilling to acknowledge the Founding Fathers' inspired and timely experiment, one must wonder, 
Do they believe our liberties came about by chance or that they were spawned by evil men? If so, how do they reconcile such a position with the unerring logic of the Savior who said, ye shall know them by their fruits? It seems somewhat inconsistent to partake of and enjoy the fruits of Liberty Day today, such as freedom of speech and freedom of religion, while at the same time criticizing the very tree that produced such fruit. The Savior made it clear. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Lest there be any question, the good fruits of liberty we enjoy today spring from a good tree. And what was that good tree? The Founding Fathers. As you know, the Founding Fathers appeared to Wilfred Woodruff in the St. George Temple and had met much of their temple work done for them. Some years later, in a general conference of the church, Wilfred Woodruff testified. He said, I am going to bear my testimony to this assembly, if I never do it again in my life, that those men who laid the foundation of this American government and signed the Declaration of Independence were the best spirits the God of heaven could find on the face of the earth. They were choice spirits, not wicked men. General Washington and all the men that labored for the purpose were inspired of the Lord. President Ezra Taft Benson, who inspected the records of the St. George Temple, said, President George Washington was ordained a high priest at that time. John Wesley, Benjamin Franklin, and Christopher Columbus were also ordained high priests at that time. When one cast doubt about the character of these noble sons of God, I believe he or she will have to answer to the God of heaven for it. Well, in conclusion, what price did our founding fathers and spouses pay for our liberties? How easily we tend to forget the incredible sacrifices of our founding fathers and their wives providing these liberties. Time and luxury have a way of dimming our memories and our gratitude. Perhaps Patrick Henry best expressed their innermost passion and dilemma with his never-to-be-forgotten battle cry, give me liberty or give me death. These were more than the stirring words of gifted oratory. They were a stark disclosure of the choice that confronted them. All the odds were stacked against these revolutionaries. They had no well-trained militia, no navy, no national treasure from which to be salvaged to the soldiers or provide needed ammunition and supplies. If that, were, if that were not enough, they faced opposition from loyalists within their own ranks. By contrast, England had a mighty and well-trained army, a seemingly invincible navy, a government with power to tax and provide almost unlimited ammunition and supplies, and finally a kingdom united in its goal to keep America a glorified serfdom. From a worldly perspective, a revolutionary war on the part of the colonists was nothing less than a suicide mission. It was a modern day version of David with a slingshot against the mighty Goliath with his colossal sword and shield. Despite these overwhelming odds, the founding fathers knew this truth. The one plus God is always greater than the opposition, however great that opposition may be. The founding fathers could have quietly retreated to the comfort and wealth of their plantation, law offices and businesses, but they put all that at risk for their children, fellow Americans and future generations. In that spirit, they made this sacred pledge we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. And that is exactly what they did. Thomas Paine spoke of this critical time in history. He said, these are the times, the triumphant souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine, sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. Be it he that stands it now, deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. 
and how many souls were tried. Joseph Plum Martin, a soldier in the Continental Army, tells of his suffering in the winter of 1780. He said, we were absolutely, literally starved. I just solemnly declare that I did not put a single morsel of victuals into my mouth for four days and as many nights, except a little black birch bark, which I gnawed off a stick of wood. I saw several of the men roast, roast their old shoes and eat them. If this was not suffering, I request to be informed what can pass under the name. If suffering like this did not try men's souls, I confess that I do know not what could. There is a touching thing in the life of Martin Luther. He is about to be tried for heresy. Just before the trial begins, his friend and longtime spiritual mentor, a priest, rebukes Luther for turning the world upside down with his teaching, spurring the world on by the revolt of Protestant and then Catholics. Then, in a stirring moment, Luther grabs his friend's arm and says, he wanted me to change the world. Did you think there would be no cost? I can't help but think of the incredible cost paid by the wives of these founding fathers. They took care of their families and businesses while their husbands were gone for extended periods. They literally put everything on the altar of sacrifice. They were nothing less than angelic spouses and patriarchs. One writer noted of Martha Washington, Though she may not have been on the front lines firing a musket, she was with her husband at every winter encampment and would spend more than half of the war with George from April 1775 to December 1783. It was Abigail Adams who said of her husband, when he is wounded, I bleed. And on another occasion she said, I wonder if future generations will ever know what we have suffered in their behalf. Hopefully, we will never forget. Hopefully, we will remember and appreciate our inspired family fathers and God's unmistakable hand in America. His fingerprints are literally everywhere. May we ever remember these words of the psalmist. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the words of the prophet Moroni, Behold, this is the choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if, if they will but serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. May we never forget God's hand in the origin of America, which I testify is real and substantial. And we may we pray earnestly for his hand in our future destiny, I shall pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sister Child Street, you did at this point. We were grateful to see uh, the spirit of our divine founding through your words and your counsel tonight. Thank you so much. I, my experience, if there's three great things we need to have in our country, to, in our state, to face the ills that we have, it certainly would be first the love of God, love of man, and third, constitutional alignment. This is a, a great challenge that we face today. And it is through the example and words of these, uh, those have been quoted and presented by this wonderful, powerful couple 
we can find strength and direction and hope in the future. Our great country is yet to fulfill many important things. There's every reason to be optimistic, but we need to be awake, attentive, and alert, and stand for true principles as we seek to move forward. So again, thank you, Brother and Sister Callister. You know, this is the second time this month that I've seen this presentation. And if it was someplace I could go, I'd watch it a third time this month. I mean, it's such a blessing, and I'm so, so grateful for the dedication of this great man, Elder Callister, and his good wife for doing this for us. But you know what? We can all see it again and again and show it to our friends and family because next week, you'll be able to get go online and get the video of this entire presentation. And when you do that, then go on the floor again. Where did it come from? <laughs> Somebody rests me every time. So anyway, when you do that, please share it. Share it and share it with your families. Have your friends and neighbors come in. Have a potluck and the neighbors come in and have a, or a movie and put the popcorn and M&Ms. I always have to have M&Ms. Um, but make sure that people know about it. And then share the, the website also with others so that they can go online and, and receive it. So where you're going to be able to, to next week go online and get this is two different places. StrattonforUtah.com and utahegleforum.org, strattonforutah.com or utahegleforum.org, and you'll be able to, to share this with others. Yeah, we want to thank the Sierra for their wonderful location and their generosity. Uh, at the same time, I want to thank Kevin Stratton, Representative Stratton, for sponsoring this event tonight. What a, what a blessing it has been because he, he, loved, he loves the, the Constitution like we do, and he wants you all to be able to, to see this event. And uh, he's also uh, you know, responsible for the video. It's because he he's, has a crew here taking care of this, so we are so grateful. And uh, the Sierra also has uh, their, a sh their show right now. It's a play called uh, Bright Star. So come back and let's, let's just support the Sierra because they do such good things. Okay, our closing prayer today at night is going to be by Lynn Dayton. Lynn Dayton uh, is the husband of Margaret Dayton, Representative Margaret Dayton, Senator Margaret Dayton, she, Margaret was in the, the legislature for many years. In fact, she was the longest serving Republican woman ever in the legislature. So, such a blessing. Do we have Margaret here? And her good husband, Lynn, who always has been so supportive. So, Lynn is going to give us our closing prayer. And thank you again, all of you. Thank you for being here. We filled up the house. Isn't that a blessing? to share this night together. Thank you. Our kind Heavenly Father, we are humbled and thankful for the blessings of this evening to hear this special message presented to us by Elder and Sister Collister. We're so thankful for them and for their preparation, for their service to the land and to the gospel. Please bless them and help them with their health. We're thankful for the Constitution, and this event this evening helps us to be even more focused on its importance in our lives and in history. We pray that we will be supportive of those principles of freedom. Freedom of religion is so important. We thank Thee especially for our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
for his atonement for us and pray that we will do all that we can to serve him and to serve mankind. And thank thee now for these blessings in the Savior's name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.